So with a traditional Medicare supplement, Medicare pays first, the supplement pays after, and then you only have a bill if the supplement has anything left over. So two parties are paying in front of you, depending on which plan that you chose. So you have a higher premium up front and less cost sharing on the back end. And if you're somebody that really is going to be in a hospital and worrying about what's coming in your mailbox once you get out, a Medigap plan is probably going to provide you better peace of mind. Are you ready for a successful retirement? We're addressing the topics facing today's retirees. Welcome to Retire with Ryan. Now here's your host, Ryan Morrissey. So welcome back. We're joined again by Medicare expert and author of the best-selling book, 10 Costly Medicare Mistakes You Can't Avoid to Make, Danielle Roberts. And be sure to listen to the end of the episode to find out how you can get a free copy of her book. Welcome back, Danielle. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Last week, we discussed Medicare basics and what one should be thinking about as they get close to turning 65. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I suggest you go back and do so. And in this episode, we're going to discuss the things that traditional Medicare Part A and B don't cover and why you might want to consider getting either Medigap or also called Medicare Supplement Insurance or Medicare Advantage, as well as what the differences are and the pros and cons of each. So tell me, Danielle, what are some of the reasons why someone might want to consider getting one of these policies? Yeah, so the biggest thing that people want to buy insurance for is We mentioned in the last episode that there's cost sharing that comes with Medicare. There's deductibles for Part A and B. There's coinsurance and copays that you have to pay. And this stuff is expensive, but also one primary difference is that with insurance that you've had prior to age 65, you've always had a deductible and then a stop loss or what's called an out-of-pocket maximum to protect you from spending beyond a certain limit. Medicare doesn't have that. So Medicare pays 80% of your Part B expenses. You pay the 20% forever. So imagine that you have kidney failure and you have to have dialysis three times a week for the rest of your life. That 20% will be an astronomical amount of money. Cancer treatment often runs weeks, maybe even months at a time, paying 20% of expensive chemo treatments. And even though Medicare has Medicare allowable amounts, which are less than what you would pay cash for benefits that you might or treatments that you might get from a hospital, it's still 20% of a significant number over time like that. So the reason that people will purchase, say, a Medigap plan or a Medicare Advantage plan is to limit the risk. So with a Medigap plan, most of them will pick up that other 20%. You can choose one that covers your hospital deductible, which is $1,484 in 2021 and tends to go up a little bit every year. Medicare also only provides 150 days of hospital coverage. So a Medigap plan will add on an extra year of coverage. And these are all things that people are interested in having so that they can limit their exposure, make sure they have enough benefits when they need it. And the big thing they face really when they're turning 65 is determining which route they want to go. Because there's the two ways that you can get Medicare. One is the Medigap plan, which is called the Medicare supplement. Same thing. Or the second is Part C of Medicare, which is called the Medicare Advantage Program. And those two routes work very differently, but both in their own way are going to help you to limit those potential expenses that you would pay if you just had Medicare by itself. Less than 10% of people run with just Medicare. Most have a Medigap plan, an Advantage plan, or some type of Medicaid support if they're low income. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear it's only 10%. I would think it would be bigger. So I guess a lot of people don't smartly, right, want to expose themselves to that type of risk. That's right. You mentioned the two ways, but I guess a third would be that if someone has retiree health insurance, right? That's true. Yeah. So if you are lucky enough to work for an employer that provides that, let's say you're a government employee and you have federal employee health benefits, or you've retired from the military and you have TRICARE, then you're not going to be in a position that you would need a supplemental coverage plan. TRICARE pays secondary to Medicare Parts A and B. So you would enroll in A and B and then TRICARE wraps around and provides drug coverage too. So you don't even need the Part D. Federal employee health benefits, you could skip Medicare altogether. You could enroll in Part A only. You could enroll in Part A and B. And those things all have different ways they coordinate to lower your costs. And we don't have as many companies these days providing good old-fashioned retiree coverage, but there are still some large corporations out there that do. 
And in those, most of the time, the cases like TRICARE, Medicare primary, and then that secondary employer coverage wraps around that Medicare benefit and help. So if you have access to one of those types of coverage, it's generally going to be more robust and less expensive than buying individual coverage such as a Medicare supplement. It may not be less expensive than a Medicare Advantage plan, but you would certainly probably have more robust benefits, at least on the drug side, with those types of retiree plans. So we want to look at those very carefully, too, before you make your choice to move away from anything that's provided by a retiree plan like an employer or government benefit. Yeah, like I know with my mom, she's a retired teacher. I can't remember the name of her plan, but that's essentially her supplement. It might even be her primary. I don't really quite understand that. Yeah, the different teacher retirement plans around the U.S. all make their own decisions, but a lot of them now provide a group Medicare Advantage plan. So you enroll in that and the state or the teacher retirement service pays the bulk of the cost, and then you're just paying your portion. And a lot of people like that coverage. Some states have something that's more similar to a Medicare supplement. And there are some states like Texas where it's a group Medicare Advantage plan, but it's so expensive that they can do a private Medicare Advantage plan a lot less expensive. You have to look at the individual state to see. Often in Texas, we recommend that they do something on their own and not do the teacher retirement because of the cost. But in a lot of the other states where the benefits are well covered by the state, doing that teacher plan is going to actually be a much better bet than doing something on the private market. Yeah, I know she gets a certain amount per month back to pay for her Part B premium. Yeah, I I don't know if that's her contract or how that works, but yeah. So it's helping to pay for her Part B too. And that's a benefit where you won't find very many places. Yeah. So I believe, well, I've heard often that if you're healthier when you retire, when you're approaching 65, that you should maybe consider a Medicare Advantage plan versus a Medigap plan. Would you agree with that? or Not necessarily, but I can tell you the thinking behind it. So with a traditional Medicare supplement, Medicare pays first, the supplement pays after, and then you only have a bill if the supplement has anything left over. So two parties are paying in front of you depending on which plan that you chose. So you have a higher premium up front and less cost sharing on the back end. And if you're somebody that really is going to be in a hospital and worrying about what's coming in your mailbox once you get out, a Medigap plan is probably going to provide you better peace of mind. A Medicare Advantage plan has lower premiums up front, and instead you pay more on the back end as you go along and use the services. So to your question, a lot of people who are super healthy are attracted to Medicare Advantage plans because the premiums cost less and they don't think they're going to use the benefits very much, or at least not for a while, because at the moment they're pretty healthy and they can be really attracted to those Medicare Advantage plans for those reasons. And they can look in their area and find one that's a good fit. There are also other reasons, of course, why people would consider one over the other. Some of the things to think about are when you have a Medigap or Medicare supplement, that Medigap plan pays secondary to Medicare no matter which insurance company you buy it from. And the plans are standardized. So let's say you decide you want Medicare Supplement Plan G, which is the most comprehensive one that someone new to Medicare in 2021 could purchase. That is going to let you see any provider anywhere in the nation that accepts Medicare. There's no network. There's no referrals. If you're snowbird, if you have a house in a couple of states, if you live an RV lifestyle, if you have grandkids in Kansas and you go there frequently, you can see a doctor anywhere throughout the nation at any time and your coverage is going to work exactly like it's supposed to. And that's part of what you pay for is that freedom of choice. Now, with the Medicare Advantage plan, these are private insurance companies that are taking over your Part A and B benefits. So now Medicare pays that Advantage company to take on your risk and they give you a network. Now, the network allows the Advantage insurance company to control your access to healthcare a little bit. They're going to give you a network of people to provide. You might have to choose a primary care doctor. You might need to get a referral if you want to see a specialist, depending on the type of network that you choose. And this could be something that some people are like, sure, fine. I've had that my whole life. I don't have any problem with that at all. And it's cheaper. And I like that. And I don't do a lot of travel. So treating right here in good old Dallas, Fort Worth or wherever it is that you live works fine for me. And there'll be other people that would look at that and say, no, I don't want to have to get a referral. Why would I want that? I want to pay for coverage that has a little more flexibility. So they work very differently. And it's important to study both options before you make a choice because Medigap plans are private plans that you can opt into, which means they can turn you down for coverage unless you apply for them in the first six months after your Part B is effective. So if you want the Medigap plan that's more robust, that allows you to see anyone that doesn't have a network where you have to get referrals, you have six months to get that plan right after Part B. 
and no health questions asked. Later, you're going to answer health questions. So if you were to start with an Advantage plan and then later you wanted to change your mind and go back to original Medicare and get a Medigap plan, now you have to answer health questions in most states to get that plan. And these are all things that the average person wouldn't know. That's why we recommend someone new to Medicare should start their research at least six months prior to age 65. You can go to YouTube and watch some of our videos, lots of other videos out there about Medicare. Medicare Medicare.gov itself has a lot of information. And putting in that time up front to study the differences between the types of coverage and just get a feel for which one you think better fits your lifestyle is great. Because then when it comes time to pull the trigger and make a plan decision, you're just choosing between carriers instead of trying to learn all of those different things in a crash learning session because you waited until the day before you turned 65 to sign up. Yeah. So for Medigap, I believe there's letters that you mentioned Plan G, right? So how many plans can someone in 2021 choose from? So there's 10 standardized Medicare supplement plans or Medigap plans. And unfortunately, they are lettered the same way that the Medicare parts are. So you have Medicare Part A, B, C, and D. And then you have Medigap plan A, B, C, D, F, G, K, L, M, N, and one high deductible option. And people say, what? Now I don't understand what's the difference between a plan G and a part G. Okay, the thing to know is that there's really only three Medigap plans that are popular. Very few people sign up for Medigap plan A, B, C, or D. The three most popular plans for well over a decade have been F, G, and N. Plan F is the one that covers absolutely all the gaps in Medicare. So you go to the doctor, you pay nothing. Go to the hospital, pay nothing. Chemotherapy, you pay nothing. It's fabulous, but it's no longer available to people who turn 65 on or after January 1st of 2020. They've taken that away. So Plan G is the next most comprehensive plan, which fortunately is very similar to Plan F. The only thing it doesn't cover is the Part B deductible, which currently is $203. So Part B, remember, is outpatient. So on your first doctor visit of the year, they're going to go, Medicare is going to process the bill, and they're going to say, oh, you have to pay the first $203, then we'll pay our 80%. Once you've done that, every other bill after that pays 80, the supplement pays 20, and it's a fabulous plan, very comprehensive. But it's also going to be the most expensive one because it's got the most benefits compared to the other ones, except for Plan F, which you may not be eligible for. So Plan N is similar to Plan G, usually a little cheaper, though, because on Plan N, you also pay a doctor copay and an ER copay. And there are some doctors out there, just a few, not many in the overall scheme of things. But there are some that are called non-participating providers, which means they reserve the right to bill you up to an additional 15% more than what Medicare allows. That's called the Part B excess charge. And Plan G will pay it for you, but Plan N won't. So if you enroll in Plan N, you may sometimes have these little balance bills that comes in the mail if you happen to see a provider that charges those excess charges. But because you are taking on more risk and paying more of your own things, Plan N also has cheaper premiums. And so the person, the consumer, is going to decide which plan they feel most comfortable with and then enroll in the one that suits them the most. So Plan G, I haven't looked up what it is in Connecticut, but in Texas, what is that costing people per month? So somebody turning 65, let's say a female non-smoker in our area, might spend $100 a month for Plan G. So really affordable. But then in other places like Connecticut, Florida, New York, where the open enrollment plans are different or the population of seniors is different, they're going to cost more than that because it's going to be based on the cost of health care in the local area. Connecticut is one of the states that has wider open enrollment rules. So you can buy a plan in Connecticut more often than just that first six months that we talked about. And because people can get them even without having to answer health questions, that means the insurance companies have to take people sometimes that are sick. And that makes the plans cost more in that state. Okay. I think last time I looked, the plans were starting in the low 200s, going up to $400. So if you're looking at, let's say, you know, you've got Aetna and Cigna. I don't even know if these offer the plan G. Let's say they did. And one's 200 and one's 400. You should just choose the $200 one because the plans are identical, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at a plan G, a plan G is a plan G is a plan G. And two carriers are going to have very different premiums. That's because those carriers have been operating in that state for a while and their premiums are going to be based in part on the loss ratios. So how many people did they take on that have a lot of expensive claims? And you will have one carrier with a book of business that may be sicker than another carrier. And so over time, they have to take higher rate increases because of that. And so people will look at it and be like, how could the rates be so different? And that's usually the reason why is that they adjust their rates based on loss ratios over time. And so you're always wanting to look and see which carrier is going to be the most competitive, but certainly no reason to pay 
$200 more. I like to look at the top three lowest price carriers in someone's zip code. And then we have a software that will show us what the rate increases have been with each of those carriers over the last, say, five years. If they're a brand new carrier that's come in with a new book of business, we can say, well, we don't have claims history and that means the claims might be anything. But there's this other carrier that's been there a while and they usually charge about 6% per year. That might be a more secure choice than taking a chance on one that you're not sure of where the rate may go in the future. You may also have, like I can think of a carrier that has had ridiculous rate increases over the last few years, way above average. And if I had those two carriers to choose from, I would lean against the one that seems to be all over the place with the rates. And so those are some things that a broker could provide you that you yourself may not be able to find or even know to look for. And then using that data, financial ratings, the premium itself, and rate increase histories, you can narrow down to one that seems like a good choice for you. Yeah, that is something I didn't even think of. So if you go with one company for the Medicare supplement and they really increase your rate the next year, let's say 25%, you're stuck with them, right? You can't switch to another carrier without going through the medical underwriting, right? Yeah, you can, but you have to go through medical underwriting. So one of the things that we do when we're working with someone that's new to Medicare is if the client shares with us that they have a health condition that they know is going to mean that once they join a Medigap plan, they're never going to be able to switch. Okay, let's say they have Parkinson's. Carriers are going to often turn them down for that and it'll be really difficult for them to switch. So I'm going to look at which carrier in the area has the longest history of the most stable rate increases because no matter which carrier you choose, there's going to be a rate increase every 12 months. Healthcare is runaway inflation, very expensive, and the carriers have to adjust. Medicare also raises the deductibles each year. And so if the plan you have is covering your Part A deductible, it's paying more for you one year than it did the year before. And so those rate increases are bound to happen. We want to look for one that has a really stable history where we don't see the rates up and down and all over the place, but kind of steady so that we can look at the trajectory and say, this is what this plan is going to cost you for the next 20 years. Is this going to be affordable and fit into the retirement plan that your advisor has put together for you? And if it's more than what you can spend, then we might want to look at some advantage plans and, and go over the pros and cons of those. Yeah, because you need to be able to afford it and shouldn't be costing you more than I guess you're getting back, right? I mean, it's always a cost-benefit analysis with this, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think I've read a statistic like 40% of married couples on Social Security depend on Social Security for more than 90% of their income. You know, if you're in that situation, $100 a month for a Medigap plan might sound like insurmountable to you. And so if a Medicare Advantage is the only one that fits in your budget, then we're wanting to find which Advantage plan has the lowest out-of-pocket, includes the doctors you need, covers the meds you need, and then what do we need to be prepared for that you might pay in the event of a serious health situation, how much you might have to come out of pocket. You know, sometimes somebody might really want the more comprehensive Medigap plan, but they just can't afford it. And so then we're looking at the plans that they can't afford that are going to give them the best bang for their dollar. Yeah. I've seen commercials I don't know why I've never seen them in Connecticut, but I've ever been in Florida. I see commercials for free Medicare plans, zero cost, right? Oh, yeah. Joe Namath on there telling you the great plan. <laughs> exactly. Is there such a thing out there? Yeah. So please never call and enroll in a Medicare plan from a 1-800 number on TV because the fine print, you can't read it. And those phone salespeople are certainly not going to tell you about it. So Every year, we have a handful of clients that we have to rescue from having made a mistake like that. And the thing that they may not know is they're going to tell you it's a free plan. Okay, well, what it is is a zero premium Medicare Advantage plan. It means that you pay nothing for the plan itself, but you're still paying for Part B, which is the 14850. Sometimes they won't tell people that. They'll mislead them that that Advantage plan is going to take away that bill. We hear that one a lot. Those people are paid on commission on those phones and their job is to sign you up and doesn't matter if they told you or didn't tell you. Later, you're going to be in trouble because now you've dropped the Medigap plan and you can't get back into it because maybe you have a health condition that would prevent you. And they didn't check to see that your endocrinologist is in the network. So now you have to change from the doctor you've had all this time, but you're not in the right election period to change your plan and you're waiting. And these are all the things that make enrolling in a plan that way a terrible idea. A better idea is to say, call up someone like us and say, hey, I just saw this commercial and I mean, I love Joe Namath. He's the best, the best sports player of all time. And I'm sure he wouldn't lie to me. Tell me about this fabulous plan. And so we can pull the plan up and tell you, here's some of the great things. But what he didn't mention that you need to know about are these things, are these things okay with you? 
and make sure you get the full picture before you sign up for something. An agent needs to go over the summary of benefits for you, should never make a decision in one phone call. Get that document, look over it, write your questions down, call the agent back, have a conversation. And when you have gotten all the information and you feel confident that you're prepared for what the plan is going to provide you, then you make that decision. We often tell people not to invite an agent out to your home, to your kitchen table. Don't put yourself in any situation with a lot of pressure where you don't even know if that agent has 20 carriers or they just work for one and they're going to push you that one plan. Work with a reputable business that has good reviews that you can talk to by phone, that you can take the information away from, discuss with your spouse, discuss with your adult children, and then make that decision when you call back and you've had some time to think everything over. Yeah. Also, hey, talk to your friends or former coworkers, right? Find out what they're using, right? Because they may have already made the mistake that they can help you avoid, right? Of course. And so you should ask those questions of people that you trust and that you like, or who even are in the same financial situation as you or see some of the same doctors. You might find out about a plan that you hadn't heard of that could be a good fit. Sure. Now, can you... So we've talked a little bit about switching. So when you go into Medicap, you have the initial six months of your enrollment, right, to go in without any issue. But with Medicare Advantage, if you wanted to switch, if it made sense to go from Medicap to Medicare Advantage, there are no restrictions with making that type of move, right? Yeah, you just have to do it during a valid election period. So since Medicare Advantage plans have no health questions, you can join them anytime that you have an enrollment window to do so. So something we see a lot is somebody that will be on a Medigap plan and they're on it for years and they've been through a lot of rate increases. And now they've seen those ads on TV quite a few times. They're starting to ask some more question about an Advantage plan. It's very easy to leave original Medicare and Medigap and join a Medicare Advantage plan during that fall annual election period that we talked about from October 15th to December 7th. You can make that switch. Then you can lower your premium and have the Medicare Advantage plan. But once you're in that Advantage plan, you can only get out of it during certain election periods during the year. You may be locked into it for months on end, depending on when you decide that you want out. So just know going in, you could be in that plan for a year. You want to make sure that you like it enough and that you've checked the formulary to check that all your drugs are on there. You've made sure your doctors still are in the network. You've looked to see what it costs you for an ambulance ride and for a surgery. And these are all costs that you can afford if you needed to. And that way you don't get in the plan and decide tomorrow that you don't like it and you may not have a period to get out. Sure. Yeah. And what about like uh, dental vision? How does that fit into either these options? So Medicare itself doesn't cover routine dental vision and hearing, which we talked about. And so Medigap plans, which supplement Medicare, therefore don't either because they have to only pay for the deductibles and coinsurance on things that Medicare covers. Advantage plans can include ancillary benefits, and they often will include those to attract people to enroll in the plan so that they can get paid by Medicare. And you might find a plan that has a preventive dental benefit. You can get two free teeth cleanings a year. You may find one that covers up to $1,000 a year if you need a root canal or a filling. Um, sometimes you'll find an eye exam benefit, or maybe it'll give you $100 credit for glasses every two years. Often they offer gym memberships, so you can join the local YMCA or another gym. And they build these things in to attract you to the plan. Just be aware that those benefits often are not robust. So what you rarely will find is a dental plan that covers the type of things that you're used to having under 65 to any great extent. Like my dental plan at work covers up to $1,500 a year. It's got an 80% coverage on it. It covers white fillings and not the metal fillings. And there's all these bells and whistles where the little freebie advantage plan that you have, the freebie dental benefit might be a tiny little network and you're going to see Monarch or Castle Dental. And it's going to be this coverage for the free cheap stuff that we're not going to cover anything beyond cleanings, or it might just be a discount if you have a root canal, read the fine print and just know those benefits are not often really robust. And Medicare Advantage plans can change their benefits every year and they do. So if you join a plan and you love the vision benefit, make sure that you use it within that calendar year, because if they take that benefit away the next year, when the plan rolls over, you may not even realize that if you didn't read the annual notice of change that they send you about everything that's changing next year, and those benefits can change or be taken away. So if there's a benefit that you really like that's ancillary like that, take advantage of it the year that you join just in case it's not included the next year. Okay. That's great advice. So thanks so much, Danielle, for joining us this week. We covered a lot of great information and be sure to tune in for next week's episode where we talk about the annual open enrollment period and the things that you should be thinking about during that time. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I'll be giving away some copies of Danielle's book, 
10 Costly Medicare Mistakes You Can't Avoid. I've purchased 20 copies of Danielle's book to give away to the first people that request it. And if you're already receiving my newsletter, my weekly Retire with Ryan newsletter that comes out every Wednesday, just reply back to that, that you'd like a copy of the book and your address, and I'll be happy to send you the copy. If you're not receiving the newsletter, then go to morecwealthmanagement.com, scroll down on the homepage, click sign up. And once you get your first newsletter, then respond back with the same information that you'd like a book in your address and we'll mail it out. I would, however, request that once you do receive the book, that you also go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review, an honest review if you haven't already done so, both a star rating and something that you've benefited from by listening to the course, as well as read the book. And once you've read the book, go to Danielle's Amazon book page and leave her a review. So I hope you found this episode beneficial and I look forward to talking to you next Wednesday. Take care. You should consult a financial advisor familiar with your specific circumstances before you make any financial decisions. Nothing in this broadcast constitutes a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mention of rates of return are historical or hypothetical in nature and are not a guarantee of future returns. Ryan Morrissey, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Morrissey Wealth Management, LLC, a registered investment advisor. 